Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for logging on. Um, we have a, a great presentation today, you know, on a topic that's really something that probably a lot of us who take care of heart failure patients don't necessarily feel very comfortable with, and that's managing patients that have comorbid cirrhosis and how that affects patient hemodynamics. And today we've got a great lecture. We've got Dr. Lupe Garcia Sao from our uh, digestive diseases section here at Yale. And she's a professor of medicine uh, here at the Yale School of Medicine. Uh, she gave this talk last year uh, in our pilot series, and it was really was probably my favorite talk of the series. Um, highly informative and very educational and excited that she's back to do it again for us this year. So uh, Dr. Garcia Sal. Um, uh, thank, thank you so very much for that very kind introduction. It's always, like I said, daunting to me to give this lecture to cardiologists, but here I go. And my most important disclosure is that I am not a cardiologist, so uh, be kind. So I have, you think you have to scan this that has like two questions, I think. Uh, that you can answer them now, I guess, and then we'll repeat them at the end of the lecture. So the learning objectives are to recognize the pathophysiology of portal hypertension and the hyperdynamic circulation in cirrhosis, understand the pathophysiology of cardiac dysfunction associated with cirrhosis, what we call cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, in relation to the different stages of cirrhosis, and this is very important, and identify what we're doing to these patients that may lead to heart decompensation, or what, what the causes that they may have that may lead actually to this heart decompensation. So what is cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? So that was like in 1953, these um, investigators uh, coined the term cirrhotic cardiomyopathy uh, to describe a spectrum of chronic cardiac dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis in the absence of known heart disease, and this was regardless of the etiology of cirrhosis. And the components are mostly hyperdynamic circulatory state, inability of the, of, of the sinus to increase heart rate during exercise, impaired contractility, that's systolic dysfunction, also diastolic relaxation, diastolic dysfunction, and electrophysiological abnormalities, particularly QT prolongation. So let me go to so what, what is so that's the normal liver is nice and red and smooth. Anything that chronically affects the liver, and right now our main etiology are mash and alcohol, each of which can actually damage the heart in itself, right? But and this, but then all these etiology end up with the cirrhotic liver, and that's a distorted yellow liver uh, that is entirely nodular. And again, these are our main etiologies. But cirrhosis is not just cirrhosis, there are at least three stages, three prognostic stages. The compensated patient that may look like any of us in, in, in the room, the median survival exceeds 15 years. The decompensated patient, the median survival it goes down to two years. And now we've described a new stage of further decompensation for the median survival is nine months. That is half of the patients are gonna be dead in nine months. The, 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 like I said, compensated cirrhosis, has no symptoms related to cirrhosis. They may or may not have varices, but these have not bled, all right? Then um, the compensation is defined by either ascites, variceal hemorrhage, or hepatic encephalopathy occurring at once or, or just one of them occurring um, at once. Uh, for the compensation is when you have a second event, let's say the patients are with ascites, now months or years later, they develop variceal hemorrhage, or um, the patient now has recurrent variceal hemorrhage, recurrent or refractory encephalopathy. And the ascites is now not responding to that risk, requires paracentesis. And the hallmark of further decompensation is the thing, the thing that we call hepatorenal syndrome that we'll talk about. The main driver of decompensation is a pressure thing. It's what we call clinically significant portal hypertension, right? But the main driver of further decompensation is an inflammatory and vasodilatory state that affects these patients. John, this is part of further decomposition. It has nothing to do with inflammation and vasodilation, it, but we put it there because it, it indicates that the liver is not working anymore. So that's part of further decompensation. So in general terms, you'll say child A, our patients are compensated, child B, our patients are decompensated, child C, patients are further decompensated, and um, you know any calculator can give you the, the child class. So this is the way it works. So you have the cirrhotic liver, there's a distorted sinusoids that increases the resistance to the, to the portal vein right away. This leads first to mild portal hypertension. So the hepatic venous pressure gradient is six to 10 millimeters of mercury, but this is enough 
to for the splenic arterioles arterioles to sense this increase in pressure. They they um, synthesize more nitric oxide. They vasodilate. This increases the flow into the portal system. This now leads to a in further increase in pressure, so that now the patient has what we call clinically significant portal hypertension that the AVPG has increased to more than 10. And it's only then that these collaterals open up so the patient has varices. And also because they're vasodilated, there's effective hypovolemia that baroreceptors feel. So there's activation of neurohormonal systems, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, the sympathetic nervous system, ADH. This leads to sodium water retention. So it's a hypervolemic state. This increases cardiac output, increases the flow even more. And so therefore, and these neurohormonal systems are activated actually cause vasoconstriction inside the liver and increases the resistance further. So you can understand that if there's an increase in, in, in pressure here, there's ascites formation, there's sodium and water retention, this will lead to ascites. Uh, if the flow keeps increasing through these varices, they will grow and they will rupture they have, for you to have variceal hemorrhage. And finally, if there's shunting that the liver's not looking at, the ammonia cannot metabolize it, you get encephalopathy. So the three main complications of cirrhosis that define the compensation are due that, to this that we call clinically significant portal hypertension. But in regards to this talk, let's talk about this increased cardiac output and this high, out, uh, high output state. And this was described like centuries ago, like a long time ago in 22 patients with cirrhosis. And they were like actually very cool. You can see how the cardiac index was more and more increased, especially when they looked at what they call the wet cirrhosis. Uh, and these are patients that did not have a size versus patients who had a size. You can see how the cardiac is, is, is much more increased in a patient that's decompensated. And there was an indirect correlation between the cardiac index and the, and, and the vasodilation. So the more vasodilated the patient, the higher the cardiac index. And they also noted a high incidence of QT prolongation. This is back um, yeah, a long time ago. Anyhow, um, so my uh, mentor, uh, Roberto Grossman, had all these studies that showed, that demonstrated this, this, this hyperdynamic circulatory state, in, in first in rats with portal vein ligation. So the nor li livers are normal, but there's an increase in resistance. The por there's portal hypertension. And then he, he would look at the... Uh, portal vein ligated versus sham operated and see the flow rate. Increase the flow rate and NO concentration would increase more, but look at the portal vein ligated. This, this perfusion of superior mesenteric artery in these patients, it meant that they were like much more hyperdynamic. The, the NO was increased, they were more vas vasodilated and the, the perfusion was, was higher. Later on, this is our rats with carbon tetrachloride induced cirrhosis and ascites. You can see that this is at, at, the, at the baseline. The controls are the white columns, ascites without bacterial translocation. They already had a, a, a decrease in the SMA, a spear mesenteric artery perfusion pressure. So they're sort of vasodilated. Um, and with a higher dose, this is metoxamine. So this is a vasoconstrict. So uh, you can see that, that, that they were already, they would not respond as well. And if they had bacterial translocation, which is what um, these patients and animals have, when, when there's increase in portal pressure, you can see that there was an even lower response to metoxins. They were more vasodilated. In little splack, the chemodynamics, if you look at the systemic chemodynamics, animals with bacterial transgression had the lowest MAP and the, and versus the controls. And the patients with ascites, with the, I'm sorry, the animals with, with ascites would have like an intermediate um, vasodilation, they had decrease in mean arterial pressure. This is a study we did in, in, in patients uh, that had, it, this is in Italy, where all the patients had HVPG measured, they had their hemodynamic the map and the cardiac index measured. And we had, for the first time, we could actually stage them based on, 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 on current knowledge. So we had those with mild portal hypertension, those with CSPH who do not have varices, patients with varices. These are normal. The mild portal hypertension had a normal cardiac thickness, a normal map, but 
even when they develop clinically significant portal hypertension, there was already an increase in cardiac index and a, and a decrease in MAP, and furthermore in the virus. But if you look at the decompensated patients, that's when they had the maximum increase in cardiac index and a decrease in MAP, hyperdynamic circulatory state. Now, in refractory society, you know, the MAP went down even further. These are very vasodilated, but the cardiac index did not go up as one would expect. It actually was lower. And so we wonder whether this is part of the car cirrhotic cardiomyopathy where the heart has been stressed all this time and now the patient gets sicker and now you develop even uh, this decrease in mean arterial pressure. And all of this is associated with increase of an inflammatory state. This is a C-reactive protein. All throughout the stage, there's a higher and higher infl inflammatory, including in those with refractory side that, that may be also affecting the heart. And this Increased inflammatory state is associated with bacterial translocation that we talked about, which is an, a, a non-overt, it's a covert infection in a way that increased the PAMPs, um, the, the pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And, but also there's hepatocyte, ongoing hepatocyte injury that increases damps. And so this, this whole thing is what is called the cirrhosis-associated immune dysfunction that leads to this inflammatory state and that leads to this circulatory dysfunction. Now, so... You have seen this, this hyperdynamic circulation and cirrhosis is resembles what you would call a high output heart failure. So this has got this biosis, you have bacterial translocation, splachnid vasodilation, there's an increase in shear stress, and or release, this leads to vasodilation. Then you have a hyperdynamic circuitry state, right? And this increase in vasodilation due to portal systemic shunting and translocation lead to worsening hyperdynamic circulation and central hypovolemia. So what about the heart? What does the heart do in this setting? So this, again, these are all studies looking at heart in patients with alcoholic and non-alcoholic cirrhosis. And you can see here that while at baseline, you know, the heart rate is fine, you know, they, 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 with exercise, this is after exercise, they increase the heart rate, but not as much as an age-related heart rate. So they're, once you stress them with exercise, they're, they're, they do, the heart does not respond as a normal individual would. And the same here, this is during exercise. This is a, in a very low increase. The change in our uh, cardiac was um, 90, plus 96% or plus 97%. But again, when you looked at the stage of cirrhosis, the child A had an increase of 121%, which was pretty okay, but the child B, C had a lower response. So the sicker the patient is, the, this heart has been handling a lot of volume and is not responding to exercise as it would. So this wonders, is there a decreased beta adrenergic response in these patients? And the answer is yes. These are studies by Sam Lee, who has worked on this a lot, mostly in experimental animals. And he showed that in, in patients with, with, in rats, I'm sorry, with cirrhosis, there's a decreased cardiac response to uh, isoproteranol. These were, this was the, first of all, the plasma noradrenaline levels, like I said, that CNS is activated, cirrhosis had the highest levels. And then when they gave him isoproteranol to um, stress the heart, you can see here how this, this is the response. You need this huge amounts of, of isoprenaline to actually um, cause this rate rise in heart. So th this this is because the heart is not responding properly to this uh, to um to this stress. And actually, um, this only happened in cirrhotic animals, not in patients with um with with um portal vein stenosis, but patients who have uh, but rats who had cirrhosis, and. When they looked at the beta-1 versus beta-2 receptors, only the beta-1 receptors were the ones that were significantly decreased, not the beta-2. So this is, seems to be like a heart-related um, type of, uh, of problem. I don't know if you're seeing this. Anyhow, so, and this is um, something that is newer. This is a, a um, colleague of mine who's in Spain that has been looking at this, and she, um, well, they looked at, at at what is called the Emacs, which, is, which are these... Um, uh, uh, volume pressure uh, cycles, right? And but what? But because when you want to measure systolic function, and you'll correct me with this, you have to always consider volume. But when you look at this slope, this slope is called the Emacs, and this is this measures systolic function independent of volume. 
So what they did, they they they, they did it in in, in a, these were pigs. These were normal pigs. And then they correlated this with something that was non-invasive using Doppler echocardiography. So they measured the ejection intraventricular pressure difference. And they showed that this correlated beautifully with the EMF. So this is a non-invasive way of looking at the at the systolic function, right? So, so this is a non-invasive way to assess the, the systolic function. And obviously, the greater the EIVD, the more robust the systolic function. That's positive in optimism. So then they looked at patients, right? This is a one patient with chest pain. Uh, the Emax was 2.7. The dilated cardiomyopathy, as you would expect, has a low Emax. And the patient, one patient with cirrhosis had 2.3. I'm, I'm not sure what type of cirrhosis this patient had. Like, um, was it compensated or decompensated? But what is very cool then, they confirmed the data that I showed you before in pigs, in humans, showing that this AIVPD correlates actually very well with the Emax. But then they looked at the different patients that they were looking at, and you see obviously dilated cardiomyopathy, the green dots were low, but patients were sort of all, all over the place. You know, some of them had high, some of them had low. So, and it has to do with the stage of cirrhosis. So then they looked at this EIBPD based on the child class, A, B, or C. This is the control. The A is pretty much like the control, the child C, which is the first decompensated patient had the high. So these, these hearts are maximally, the systolic function is, is, is maximum. So they have an inc a, the most increased inotropism is occurring in the most in the sicker patients. And this happened with, whether they did it with this child pew class or where they did it with the male score. The male score is a measure of liver function that they use to, to decide who's going to go for transplant. And again, this was a, a direct correlation. The sicker the patient, the higher the systolic function. So the thing is, so, and in, the, in this study, they showed that this increased systolic function was associated with indices of, of sympathetic nervous system activation. So as I had explained prior, but once they stress them, so they give them phenylephrine. Look at the patients. So, so this is the baseline, the IVPD. The, the ones that had, had the highest systolic function were the ones that would have the lowest response to stress. So they would decompensate. The, 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 so the highest, the patient with, who had a baseline increased systolic function that had, they also had more vasodilatation and they were more inflamed. So more IL beta, but and 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 so this indicates that with stress, these patients that had the high systolic function were decompensating more once you stress them. So in a in a in in a in patient with advanced cirrhosis in whose systolic function at baseline is most increased, stressors like uh, you know uh, infection will lead to a greater heart decompensation. So. I'm going to tell you what are the stressors that lead to heart decompensation in, in advanced cirrhosis. And again, we're talking about mostly the decompensated patients. Infection, for example. Patients with ascites can get infection of the ascites as a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And they look at those who develop renal failure versus those who did not. And those who did had, had obviously, they were more hyperdynamic or, or, or um, had a lower cardiac output, had but however, they were more activated in the renin and norepinephrine, and they also had more inflammation. They had more TNF alpha, but they had a decreased cardiac alpha. So the infection in itself with these high inflammatory markers led to a dysfunction, a cardiac dysfunction with infection. Now, more clear with non-selective beta blockers. So we're recommending non-selective beta blockers to prevent decompensation in the compensated patients, but we also use it to prevent recurrent variceal hemorrhage in patients who have bled. And so this study by, uh, they used again the EIVPD as a measure of systolic uh, function. And again, the maximum child Bs um, that, that uh, this is child A, I'm sorry, and child Bs were, were more activated. And again, male less than 17 and male more than seven, uh, 17. So sicker patient, more activation. That it, I already showed you that. And the plasma norepinephrine, again, uh, was higher, uh, correlated directly with the, with the systolic function. So these patients, then they gave them propanol, all right? At a dose that we recommend to prevent variceal hemorrhage, which is a decrease in heart rate by 25% or heart rate of 50 to 55. 
and look what happened. And depending on what type of ascites they have. So in direct responsive ascites, there was really no changes in the AIVPD in the systolic function. It remained the same. Um, and the renal perfusion pressure dropped uh, a little bit, but only one patient went underneath this um, threshold that, that, that actually perfuses the kidneys. Whereas in patients who had refractory ascites, meaning they were already much more advanced, these are further decompensated patients, this EIVPD, when this is solid function, went down, significantly down in, with non-selective beta blockers. But more importantly, the renal perfusion pressure went down under the threshold in more than 50% of the patients. So 11 of these 20, 55%, um, four of them actually had, had renal syndrome. So this is not a good thing. So now we, 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 and uh, so now we uh, look at the, this correlate with the map. So in patients who have a, a you know, the ascites or refractory size, we may still give them beta blockers, but we measure the map. And if the map goes down, then we go down on the dose or we, or the patient may, we may decide that the patient is no longer, um, uh, you know, a candidate for beta blockers. So changes in creatinine actually correlated inversely with changes in AIBPVD as you would, ex as you would expect. Now, the most dreaded and the one that had the highest mortality is hepatorenal syndrome. And in this review, we had in, in the figure that they made for us, this cardiac output, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and decreasing cardiac output is one of the contributors of this decrease in renal blood flow that leads to hepatorenal syndrome, all right? So the heart is playing a role. So what other stressor can, can lead to this heart decompensation? Terlipressin just got approved uh, by the FDA to treat hepatorenal syndrome. And this was based on the third uh, in the largest randomized controlled trial in hepatorenal syndrome. This was a confirmed trial. Uh, they randomized patient to terlipressin versus placebo. And actually the clinical success, meaning reversal of HRS, was higher in terlipressin and placebo. And this led to FDA approval. The problem is that death, five patients died with terlipressin none died with placebo, and more adverse events occurred in telepresi with placebo. But what happened, the death due to respiratory disorders, and that respiratory disorders was the, the term that they, they used for pulmonary edema pretty much, occurred in 11% in terlipressin group versus two in the placebo group. So this is a stressor. You're increasing the, the, the post load with turley pressing and, and these, these hearts just decompensated. And if you add that to albumin, so these patients also got albumin with hepatorenal syndrome, so you're increasing the preload. And this is a study that said, oh, albumin is the best thing. Um, and and, and you, it's, it's gonna decrease infections, it's gonna decrease kidney dysfunction, and it's gonna decrease mortality. So that they had a composite primary endpoint. So they, they aimed the albumin group, they aimed to um, give them, uh, to keep the albumin level of, at more than three. The standard care group, you would just give albumin with, with a large room paracentesis as uh, other indications. So you can see here that the final result is identical. There was no benefit of albumin. Uh, e even when you looked at each of the components of the primary outcome, there were really no differences at all with albumin or no albumin. And they gave a lot of albumin in the albumin group versus nothing in the standard of care group. And you can you imagine what happened? They had pulmonary edema, oh, I'm sorry, or fluid overload in 23 patients in the albumin group, eight patients in the standard care group. Again, a stressor that led, again, to, to heart failure. TIPS, what about TIPS? What is TIPS? TIPS is a, we, it's used to relieve sinusoidal pressure and therefore stop ascites formation. And it also relieves these collaterals that are the varices. So you're making a huge bridge, right, between the hypertensive portal vein and the normal tensive hepatic vein. And so you can imagine that all the blood that is sequestered in that, in that splachnic circulation now goes to the heart, right? So it reduces portal pressure, decompresses varices. This is a treatment for varicell hemorrhage. But now the blood sequester is transferred via TIPS to the systemic circulation. So, um, in, so we know now that post-TIPS are patients who develop heart failure. So in, in the patients without heart decompensation, they're, they're all the parameters of, of, of diastolic or systolic dysfunction are much more marked in those without 
cardiac decomposition and then and then in those people. so the e way is more altered the bmp is higher um all these parameters that are much more altered in patients who develop cardiac decomposition after tips compared to those who did not so they had much more of this cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and actually in 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 this this marker of of the isolic dysfunction determine response to TIPS and survival after TIPS. So the of if, if the patients continue to have ascites, so if the heart is sick, they will probably not respond to TIPS in the same way as the patient that does not have this heart dysfunction. And the, actually the probability of survival in patients with or without the diastolic dysfunction um, was entirely different. So again, demonstrated that this after TIPS, you know, if they have, they have some diastolic dysfunction, they're gonna have a more complication and a higher mortality. And finally, transplant. You can see that this is where you measure the cardiac response. You're replacing the whole liver. So there's the, and if there are changes that there's a decrease in, 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 in stroke work and an increase in, in, in the wedge pressure, this is an abnormal response. And these patients with an abnormal response had it had had a, a poor outcome, all right? So this is another study that systolic heart failure occurring um, after transplant predicts post-transplant mortality. These are 45 cases who, who had systolic heart failure after transplant versus 180 controls. They uh, said that stress-induced cardiomyopathy was the most common cause of this systolic heart failure. So you can see that before OLT, that was their ejection fraction. Within six months, there's this is the group of 45 cases where it dropped. And there were 21 or so 46% that actually recovered, but some that remained low. And um, the differences between the cases and the controls was that the controls pre-transplant had a higher, a, a, a higher percentage had a low, low uh, eleven ventricular ejection fraction of less than fifty five percent, and more, more less of them had a diastolic dysfunction. So, the outcomes in those with heart failure post transplant was higher mortality uh, and actually graft failure and one year mortality as well. So I'm um, I'm giving you the I just went through over the pathophysiology as it is. There's there's definitions of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, and these are the ones there. There was a group in in 2013 that was the Montreal group. Now the new one was in um 2020, and um you see that these are they are parameters of systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, and there's other supporting criteria which um mainly are electrocardiographic or electromechanical uncoupling. So, oh, I don't know why this is not moving. Huh. So in conclusion, I've shown you that heart failure in cirrhosis multifactorial is much more common in advanced stages of cirrhosis where the hyperdynamic circulation is most prominent. It's generally asymptomatic but it's unmasked by stress. If they get an infection, beta blockers, tips, transplant, you, totally pressing now, you, you will get this heart failure. Uh, and it's, all the studies have, have lumped all the patients with cirrhosis together. So we have to be cognizant of this and we need to stratify these patients better so that we know who are the ones that are more likely, or what are the predictors of someone developing this beyond what the hyperdynamic circulation is now? Until now, we have considered that this is independent of etiology of cirrhosis, but I was talking to uh, Mike before this, and we don't know, now with metabolic associated steatohepatitis, which is what we used to call NASH, the heart may be damaged, so that may be a problem. Again, the treatment for now is non-specific and supportive, but and it seems to resolve after transplant, but we're not entirely sure about that. Um, and that is all, but I don't know why I, I cannot advance the slides now, but I think this is my last slide anyhow. Well, thank you so much for that. Again, it's such a complicated topic and um, something that I know personally I, I need Oh, to there you go. That's the post-lecture survey. I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, since I just personally know I'd have to go through it time and time again to really kind of get a good grasp on this. Um, it's it, 
it's complicated yes but it's but but it's i think we're getting more and more of an understanding of it and i think you 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 have to be kind of at least to say is this a compensated patients are like your normal patient the fur decompensated the patients that have ascites and hepatoremal syndrome those are the ones that are the most altered very very sick patient population for sure yeah any questions from the group um, out there? I know we had a couple of people jump off already since we're at the top of the hour. I'm sorry. Oh, fantastic. Do you, I guess, my just a quick question is, you know, as you displayed this data showing worse outcomes with a lot of interventions that are very commonly performed for patients that have this problem with their liver, is this something that's usually discussed or thought of, you think, by most gastroenterologist or hepatologist? No, no, I'm, I'm trying to teach them. So, so what I'm trying to say, you know, I think that we should all, and I don't know, I, I am a proponent of, of teaching them how to do point of care ultrasound. You know, we have to be able to assess the volume or the heart for somehow you have to teach us to do this, you know, because I think that we are straight. People thought that album was like the whole, we're giving album like you cannot even believe. And now with truly present, it's just a, a, a disaster waiting to happen. If we could have some way that we could be trained, you know, in terms of assessing volume and heart function, like non-invasively, that would prevent us from using these measures in, in these patients. So Issa has a question here in the in the chat. It says, yeah, what is GDMT? Yeah, I, I can I can answer this one probably because this is a heart failure question. So he was asking, uh, apart from non-selective beta blockers, is any of GDMT heart failure medication show any promise? And this is like your like what? Like your renin angiotensin system inhibitors, like lisinopril, losar. Mm. So yeah, the problem with those is they are vasodilators. Do you see that is a main problem? And, and I agree with you. The problem is where with, with nitrates, we usually use beta blockers with nitrates, and so then this vasodilatory system gets worse. So that is not good in patients with cirrhosis. That's a problem. I would concur with that. That patients, you know, in this patient population with them being already so vasodilated using other yeah that's a great question actually yeah because you do do that but now we're we're shying away from that but now we're doing worse things we're giving them totally pressing this super vasoconstrictor and you know the heart cannot stand it yeah, it's, it's tough because you're having competing uh competing uh problems. correct correct well uh, lupe thank you so much again for taking the time here um Wonderful uh, presentation as always. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. I hope everybody has a great rest of their, their day. Thank you so much.